Hello, I'm Claire Freeman, Director of the Natural History Society of Northumbria. Welcome to this week's talk, one in a series of NHSN's Winter Nature Talks programme. As a society, we've been sharing talks since the year we were founded in 1829. And in those early years, many people would have been isolated in their pursuit of natural history. So over those 191 years since, we have been bringing people together to hear about the latest discoveries and environmental findings. This year, digital technology, we hope, will enable us to share the talks with many more people to inspire them to care for and protect nature. Please do visit our website to find out more about NHSN and also, you might like to keep in touch with us for news about Northeast Nature. I now hand over to one of my colleagues who will introduce this week's speakers, and I hope you enjoy the talks. Hello, and welcome to our main Natural History Society talks this Friday evening. My name's Chris Redfern, and I'm the Ornithology Coordinator and one of the NHSN trustees. Our main speaker tonight is Dr Lowell Mills. Lowell is a Newcastle University zoology graduate and while here during his undergraduate days he trained as a ringer with the Natural History Society ringing group. After graduating from Newcastle he did a master's research degree in ecology and environmental biology at Glasgow and followed that up with a postgraduate diploma in geographic information systems at the University of Ulster. That well thought out career progression with the additional edge provided by his ring training of course has enabled Lowell to study for his PhD at the University of Exeter where he's done some fascinating and important work on the diet of cuckoos. So it's a great pleasure to be able to introduce Lowell as our main speaker tonight. So over to you Lowell. Evening everybody, I'm Lowell Mills sometime postdoc and ecological consultant through Newcastle University. Um, I'm also an alumnus of the BSc zoology degree at Newcastle and I'm now a member of the Natural History Society of Northumbria. But up until last year I was a PhD at University of Exeter and today I'd like to talk to you about uh, some work that's just come out relating to work I've done at Exeter on the common cuckoo. So my PhD was looking at various aspects of what cuckoos need ecologically on the breeding grounds. And this particular talk and paper that it concerns explore the uh, diet of the cuckoo um, as a potential factor in their decline. So cuckoos are in decline patchily across their breeding grounds in Europe, including patchily declining in the UK. They have a number of unique or fairly unique uh, life history attributes. Along with the great spotted cuckoo, they are one of two uh, obligate brood parasite birds in Europe. Their young are raised by songbird foster parents. Additionally, they have a fully invertebrate diet, according to the literature, and they're a long distance migrant. As a long distance migrant using the humid zone, which is the bottom category on this figure from the state of the UK's birds, they travel some of the longest distances uh, from their breeding ground uh, of any land bird on Earth, because the birds breeding in places like Far East and Russia use the same breeding ground as ours. We can see this humid zone uh, collective of migrant birds breeding in Britain, all wintering in the Northern Hemisphere, um, winter in uh, the humid zone, have a very high rate of decline with just under half of them in uh, having had a major long-term increase of more than 50% since the early 1990s. But however, they also have uh, variation in population trend within the breeding ground. Now if this was relating to their migration, the question would be are cuckoos in these different regions undertaking different migration routes 
or some other aspect of migration? Well, limited tracking data, limited number of individuals that are tracked by satellite tagging by the BTO give mixed evidence. Birds breeding in Scotland and birds breeding in England don't show a uniform one way or the other difference in migration route. I would recommend that you take a look at the BTO's um, published and um, preliminary new data relating to the tracking of their adult cuckoos. It really is staggering. But just quickly to summarise myself, birds breeding in the north and west of Britain and birds breeding in the south and east of Britain uh, between them undertake collectively uh, two, different, two different migratory routes but not clean cut between the two sections of, of Britain. So some birds take a uh, southbound route uh, through Spain and into the western portion of Africa on their southbound route and others travel through a more easterly southbound route through Italy or the Balkans. But all birds return by the same northbound uh, migration route, and most birds use a very, very relative, relatively narrow wintering region in southeast and southeast central Africa, like the Congo and Angola. So maybe the explanation for why there is this um, within breeding ground variation in population trend between increasing in the northwest and decreasing very drastically in the south and east is due to some sort of difference in sympatric um, breeding ground resources such as food or habitat, either a difference in their occurrence or a difference in type or a difference in long-term trend in those things. The first step in identifying what might be going on with the food is to identify the key prey. So at the start of planning field work and uh, data collection for PhD on ecological needs of the cuckoo at Exeter, I noticed some uh, popular press coverage of um, work done by a research group in Singapore um, using data geotagged into social media um, as a form of sort of incidental citizen science to do quantitative analysis in ecology for conservation area use. And that got me thinking whether there might be a way to use images uploaded of high resolution to places like Flickr to identify adult diet of the cuckoo. We had at our disposal in uh, that part of Britain, Barry Hemwood of the Devon Moth Group, whose name you might know from um, if you've recently purchased a new copy of the Field Guide to the Caterpillars of Great Britain and Ireland. He's one of the authors of this. And this was really aiming to um, get to the bottom of the recent um, caterpillar only, large caterpillar only diet of the common cuckoo in, um, in Britain using uh, an, a method with a very wide geographic area of study and combining that with expert uh, single person ID skills. And that would sort of have the same biases as the historic uh, literature of sort of field observation of cuckoos but would just have a more up-to-date um, timeline it would and it would take place over a, a larger geographic area with with expert ID skills and over the last few decades um, by leaps and bounds really um, DNA methods um, for identifying um, uh, avian diet and other animal diet have come along in um, both in accessibility and affordability and these two studies here um, were quite uh, big influences on what we ultimately um, directed our work into for the cuckoo. So in the first study listed here um, it was notable for creating useful primer sequences which I'll um, sort of decode a little bit on the next slide. And follow up to that, a larger team from a similar sort of uh, collective of academics applied this, um, this, these techniques for identifying 
um, prey by DNA means to the faeces of bats collected from roosts. So just to decode some of this um, jargon in these titles, PCR is the polymerase chain reaction. It is where DNA is sort of forced through a cycle of different temperatures and reagents uh, to replicate uh, at a um, artificially high rate and to uh, replicate a specific region of the DNA. And that's achieved using those primers, which I just described as, um, which I just referred to. DNA barcoding, uh, in this case, the region of the DNA that you're trying to perform PCR on or amplify is a specific region of the animal um, mitochondrial genome, uh, which has been discovered through the 80s and 90s to be um, useful as effectively a DNA barcode. That is, the sequence of DNA bases is largely similar within a species and largely different between species. And this allows the identification of um, species against a database of known sequences. And lastly, <clears throat> excuse me, lastly, this, this type title here also refers to arthropod prey, uh, which uh, were, would also be of high relevance to um, cuckoo diet, as the literature refers to them only feeding on arthropods. In this second title, we see high throughput sequencing, and this is the industrial scale uh, detection and reading of DNA uh, from biological samples such as feces, uh, which we applied in our study. So to achieve those kinds of studies, um, you need the lab to have access to both these pieces of equipment or be able to outsource to what the latter piece of equipment. Um, Exeter has these and um, at Newcastle as well, the go-to for this work would be Darren Evans and his team at School of Natural and Environmental Sciences. On the left is the PCR um, machine effectively. It's a thermal cycler which causes the DNA to go through a cycle of different temperatures which enhances its um, conditions for replicating and makes mass copies via the choice of primer that you use, which are small strands of DNA um, that start and end each, um, respectively start and end the region that you're trying to replicate um, on mass. It replicates mass copies of that DNA region, which as I've described is the, um, the animal DNA region, which uh, acts as a DNA barcode, which is called the COI region of the um, of animal DNA. And on the right is a high throughput sequencer. This is the Illumina MySeq platform that was used for um, this work at Exeter that um, underlies our study. Um, samples which have already gone through PCR placed into the platform and the sequencer reads off the DNA sequence as each base um, is added to a uh, replica of the sequence um, found within the sample that went into the chamber. As each base is added, it gives off a uniquely coloured fluorescence, which is then kept track of by the machine. And this ultimately keeps track of all the sequences present in your sample uh, to a, quite a significant extent. And the outputs of the sequences that are read are put out as enormous files of text of those DNA bases, A, T, G, and C, plus a couple of other coded uh, letters for either A or T, either G or C. Uh, if you were to open those files on a conventional PC in WordPad or something like that, it would probably crash your PC straight away with the use of all the memory. So instead, powerful computers uh, analyze and pull apart the parts that you need and um, make the associated connections to uh, identify them as species uh, through an entire discipline of uh, DNA science called bioinformatics. On the project in question, we had um, various uh, leads on the DNA side of things, as well as myself as a PhD student. Uh, Dr. Anka Lang uh, really helped industrialize the uh, lab side of things, uh, the lab um, extraction of DNA. DNA extraction incidentally can be done in your own home with some uh, reagents like washing up liquid and very strong ethanol, but um, it's not what we did here. So um, 
Dr. Lang was important for the um, DNA extraction and uh, subsequently that PCR, which I referred to on the left in the previous slide. Then Dr. Karen Moore uh, leaded up the uh, high throughput sequencing use of the Illumina MySeq platform. And Hazel Knight, who herself is only a PhD student at the time of this work, uh, performed the bioinformatics, uh, which led to this uh, diet data, this molecular diet data from cuckoos. But to do all of that, first of all, you need fecal samples. And how did we get those? Well, we knew that one method might be to uh, catch cuckoos under license. And we knew that given how scarce they are at a given site and how uh, their anatomy is almost built to escape mist nets with very short tarsi or legs and uh, very long wings, and very soft plumage, that it was really a big, uh, a big priority really to set um, some sort of supplementary or even majority means of field sampling without capture. We knew that from the field craft involved in nest recording, the best course of action would be to find a way to lock in on uh, a cuckoo that's in the field in a view such as this. And having seen it deposit, basically to walk in on it and keep your eye fixed on the ground and see if we can put a stick in the ground underneath where the cuckoo was perched and search around it. And that's exactly what we did. It ended up being the majority source of our samples. And it is helped partly by the fact that fresh feces can be uh, collected up and then actually tested back at the lab to see if it is from cuckoo from the same sort of DNA methods as I've already described. So here we mark the spot with a stick having walked in. That was a particularly small sample, which you can see just at the left end of the stick that's pointing at it, lying on the ground, the little twig. And that stick uh, now is at the base of the tree highlighted in yellow and highlighted in black is where the cuckoo was sat. That's where we found the sample and that's where the cuckoo was. So that was quite a good indication. Through such uh, field craft techniques, we had successes early on, sort of beginner's luck. The first cuckoo that I sighted at the first field site I visited on the first day of field work um, gave a fecal sample, but they weren't all that easy. Looking closely at some of the fecal samples we collected, you could already start to see some of the um, hairy caterpillar hairs listed in the literature were found on the surface of some of the droppings we collected. We also found that some of the feeding sites, the ejected uh, digestive tract of, for example, here, probably a drinker moth, given that it is well over five, six centimeters long. It's been ejected while uh, whipping the caterpillar through the air to rid the caterpillar of some of its distasteful um, innards before swallowing the not still not very appetizing outer layer of spiny irritant hairs. And cuckoos really don't seem to mind this in the short term. And it is given in the literature that they can regurgitate uh, the lining of their stomach, which carries large amounts of the hairs that are now sort of impaling into the walls of the stomach. I'm, we never got to see this for ourselves, but we really wanted to. The results of the work that I've um, described methodology there are in this uh, newly published article in Journal of Avian Biology. We were lucky enough to get the cover thanks to a fantastic photo by our um, one of our PIs, Charles Tyler, at the University of Exeter. Looking at the frequency of um, different invertebrate taxa that were found. Um, here we uh, dif we just determined, sort of discriminated between on the left, uh, large bodied invertebrates and on the right, very tiny bodied invertebrates, which may have, and I, I can go into this a little uh, later on, um, may have entered into the uh, data set via being things like the prey of the prey and um, other such routes, very sort of strange routes you might not have to consider in other, in other forms of diet study. But on the left, in, um, in the left-hand curve, are all large-bodied invertebrates and I identify them here. So 
Lepidoptera are lep, and that is moths and butterflies. Orth is orthoptera, and that is grasshoppers. And dip is diptera, and those are true flies. Most prevalent across fecal samples in terms of percent of samples containing them was uh, Laziocampidae, which are the egger moths, such as the drinker, the oak egger, and the uh, fox moth. Acridae are true grasshoppers, and green common green grasshopper is one of the commonest uh, orthoptera on Dartmoor. And a large number of uh, our DNA sequences from Acridae were um, identifiable to species level as common green grasshopper. The Limacodidae are a very small family of um, moths which are part of a larger um, superfamily, Zygenoidea, which includes the Burnett moths, which we think was the actual uh, reason that we got Limacodidae DNA in our samples, um, as neither Limacodidae species is found on Dartmoor. That's a bit of a mystery, but we think it was to do with Burnett moths. Nymphalidae are a very large butterfly group and include small heath, which we um, considered to be the most likely species of butterfly being consumed here. Ragionidae are snipe fly, which is sort of large mosquito morph flies, uh, which are harmless to humans, but um, they are predatory flies and may explain why we got some of the prey species we did from the very tiny invertebrate category, such as grass flies. The tipulids are crane fly, but at the time of year that um, we were collecting faecal samples from cuckoos, the chances are that the majority of them were being fed, on, fed upon in the form of leather jackets or the larvae. And the geometridae are a large uh, moth family, which includes some very common um, day flying species on Dartmoor, like the lead bell. And because we collected faecal samples over the full time of the duration of the adult cuckoo stay on Dartmoor. Um, we were able to uh, break up the sample of um, early and late breeding season fecal samples and compare the prevalence of some of these large invertebrates between early and late breeding season. You can see only significant uh, differences are marked with an asterisk and there's only one for tipular day. So there weren't a, a large number of statistically significant differences However, just generally speaking from the graph, we see that drinker moth and the true fly taxa were more frequent in the early season and it was significant for tipulids, which is leather jackets. On the other hand, grasshoppers and most of the moth and butterfly taxa, other than the drinker moth, were more frequent in the late season. From photo analysis, we see that through Scotland, England and Wales, adult cuckoo diet from photos uh, was largely consistent. Uh, as I say, it carries some of the same biases as field observation anyway. But if you were to be expecting uh, large identifiable prey to be the most prevalent in your data set, then it is uh, difficult to understand why the garden tiger, which is the woolly bear, could only be found in a couple of photos from Scotland and nowhere else. Uh, that is the flesh coloured uh, wedge in Scotland uh, pie chart. You can see that fairly consistently that the majority of um, prey taxa for adults was um, drinker moth in blue and oak egger in sort of burgundy. And a small number of sort of miscellaneous species with most data coming from England. Juvenile prey on the other hand were collected from, the data set is collected from across Britain. They, remember these are independent feeding juveniles, um, so partly because they are perhaps beginning to feed after the majority of adults have actually already left. That might explain why their diet is of a similar morph of caterpillars, but largely different species. There's, we see very little overlap, um, with cinnabar moth being the main uh, prey of choice. Again, that is quite an identifiable. Um, that is quite an identifiable species, but we see also um, a range of other uh, late emerging caterpillars. We see cabbage white uh, butterfly caterpillar. 
we see um, fox moth, which is the one in yellow. So overall, juvenile diet was large caterpillars, but different species to the adults. The impact of the results, first off, some key prey, most critically, um, the moth and butterfly species and grasshoppers are already known in the literature to be very vulnerable to various intensive agricultural practices. Intensive grazing and drainage, uh, for example, uh, can rid uh, improved grasslands of grass diversity and remove some food plants of uh, species like uh, the drinker moth. We also see mechanised cutting of hedgerows and margins and agrochemical use, which can uh, cause uh, either physical or chemical damage to um, immobile and maybe even mobile phases of some of these um, invertebrates' life histories. We're looking else, elsewhere at the impact of these results, this study has also demonstrated successfully the use of a field-based uh, non-capture sampling method for diet of cuckoos collecting faecal samples without capture and this could perhaps be applied to other scarce or low density birds of open habitat like some of the raptors, the harriers, um, merlin or nightjar perhaps. We also see photographic studies started to sprout up along the same lines as ours during and since uh, the completion of our work. So RSPB commenced a citizen science oriented um, approach to identifying prey brought to puffin burrows by adult puffins, uh, where they recruited people to take um, entirely new photographs, but also plow into their historic um, collections of photographs so that numbers and IDs of prey brought to pufflings could be uh, looked at both historically and as I say again over that large study area but with expert analysis of and an expert identification skill. They're now actually using citizen science to identify the vast number of uh, prey from photographs that they've all the photographs that they've obtained and this could maybe be applicable closer to home with the Natural History Society and I believe some uh, preliminary work's been done to look at um, prey brought in by kitty wakes to the colonies in the centre of Newcastle. Um, I'm sure Chris can put me right on that. Uh, also we see other sort of adult bird diet studies done with photographs. So here we have a Marshall Eagle paper from uh, last year which was brought to my attention quite recently but I'd have liked to have cited it in the paper. It's a really fascinating um, study and it's quite a different beast to a cuckoo as well. So the conclusions can be drawn from the studies are, as I said at the very beginning with the maps, the contraction of the cuckoo's range has taken it from being more or less um, generalist across Britain in terms of altitude and habitat type to really just upland and semi-natural regions. So that includes stability or even an increase in Scotland, whereas crashing with perhaps 70%, 75% decrease since 1995 in England and Wales. Um, so these lowland agricultural regions are now essentially devoid of cuckoos or at least at the resolution that the atlas and things capture. And this could relate to our inability of the key prey we've identified here to complete their life cycles in these intensively managed landscapes. But the good news is that various landscape types uh, that we would need uh, already exist in Europe to allow the monitoring of cuckoo populations between these different sort of treatment groups, if you like, of nature reserves within intensive agriculture, as we're used to in this country and other Western European countries, where agriculture is intensive and we do land sparing, where nature reserves sit within the Mistletoe Islands and oases. In other parts of Britain and also in part other parts of Europe, we see something akin to some of the national parks where it is land sharing or uh, low intensity um, or certainly like low low arable agricultural system and there's also uh, examples through Europe of uh, experiments and um, implemented wildlife friendly farming and we have rewilding areas which is seemingly it might be called in vogue at the moment there's cer certain areas in Britain and in uh, Netherlands and Belgium where rewilding has been um, taking place sort of experimentally and basically these three groups plus perhaps if you like 
actual wilderness that remains in places like Finland and arguably in Scotland could be considered treatment groups for monitoring the ecological conditions and the invertebrate load on those environments and monitoring what is required for uh, cuckoos uh, declined to reverse or halt uh, cuckoo populations to be restored. In terms of future or current work, following on from what I said about, about life, cycle, life cycles of moths and butterflies and grasshoppers in um, high um, intensity agricultural areas, um, we do ask the question in an upcoming study, how do how do the life cycles and food plants of these key prey that we've identified affect those species vulnerability to specific management types? For example, um, the mechanical flailing of hedgerows and the timing of that compared to things like their when their egg stages, when their uh, pupation stages and whether they're spending those immobile stages in vulnerable locations like the outside of the food plant, the outside of hedgerows. Elsewhere, stemming from the same PhD, I ask the question, do hosts, in this case meadow pipits, struggle to raise a cuckoo compared to if they were raising their own brood under the same habitat or environmental conditions, which, if you look back through the literature on nestling cuckoos, um, given the demand that cuckoo puts on the host, it's possible that it is not a given um, that hosts just cope just as well to raise a nestling cuckoo. And then a particular black hole in the, in the ecological data on the cuckoo is the habitat requirements of the fledgling. And I'm also excited to be putting together some work on um, what we found during field work on Dartmoor in that respect as well. So I hope you've enjoyed my talk. Thank you very much for listening and I thank all of these people who were instrumental in making this happen. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Lowell. A really excellent talk. It's great work and it's fascinating to see how molecular techniques are being used uh, in bird ecology. And thanks very much for everyone for coming along. Good night. <laughs>